I'm very excited to see all of you here this morning for our first ever data camp. Yay, woohoo! <laughs> Uh, Bruce and I have been planning this for several months, um, and we're really excited to share with you what is essentially the beta version of our expanded open data program. Um, and here to get us started, or at least nearby to get us started, um, I feel very cruel for interrupting Michael's coffee run. But in a moment, you'll have a welcome from our CTO, Michael Mattmiller, um, who is really behind the creation of the new open data policy um, and the expansion of the program to include all of you. So I will delay for a few more seconds. Can we all welcome Michael? Good morning. Come on, this is Data Camp. Good morning. Thank you. Um, and thank you for uh, pardoning my caffeine interlude there. I promise it'll be more entertaining when I'm caffeinated. Um, now this is very exciting. Thank you so much uh, to Candace for all of your efforts. This was her brainchild and Bruce uh, uh, for everything uh, running the open data program. This is truly exciting. For those who have been in the city in the past two years with Mayor Murray, you've heard him talk about his vis vision for how we need to be a safe, affordable, vibrant, and innovative city for all, and a city that most importantly is data driven. And when you think about all of the work in front of us, whether it's affordable housing, uh, addressing our homelessness challenge here in the city, or so many of the projects we work on on a daily basis, we realize how central data is to understanding the state of our built environment, to understanding what our community needs, and how best to operate the billion, $5 billion business that is the corporate city of Seattle. So in coming together today, you, we are making an investment um, in you as our open data champions across the city. Now this is obviously the start of a training and an investment in a community of practice that will be working together uh, for a very long period of time. Um, but we're so excited to be able to start off with those who are truly passionate and doing great things in their departments today around data. In looking at the agenda for today's program, I think about the types of conversations you're going to have. Um, we're not going to have you sitting in Excel for three days thinking about how to use pivot tables and the 3D maps, which are pretty cool if you haven't tried those features. Uh, but in reality, this is a three-day period where you'll get to experience and learn about many of the innovative things that are happening both in our city and through our community when we find ways to share city data and bring in those brilliant minds that can help expand our capacity. Some of the things I'm thinking about, I see Ben Wellington is on the agenda. Um, I'm going to show his TED Talk video. Um, unbelievably cool. Uh, this is a gentleman in, in New York who has used a lot of the city's open data to um, perform analyses. And these aren't you know, massive data scientist types of multi-month efforts of multivariate data. It's how do we take a data set and just geolocate it on a map of the city so the public can understand how services are being delivered. Um, you've got some great speakers who have been involved in our civic technology community. I saw Ethan Goodman Phelps is speaking. There are people from across departments who are working on projects. Um, so I ask that when these speakers are talking, think about the art of the possible. Um, think about the challenges you face in your department. And while maybe uh, you don't have the resources today to think about some great new data-driven solution um, to bring the community in or to solve those problems yourself, think about the resources you have in this room. Think about the people across departments who might be working on projects. Think about Candace and Bruce and what Seattle IT can bring to the table. Because if we have that idea, if we have that way of doing something different um, or, or even knowing that there's resources in our community, collectively we can develop new and innovative solutions that we can run with, take to our department directors, and ultimately uh, make our city a better place through data. So I'm going to leave it there. I think I get to talk with you again at 1130 about some of the specific things that I'm excited about here in the city. Um, but again, thank you so much. I know it's very hard to clear three days from your schedule, and I'm so appreciative of your time. Um, and I look forward to seeing the great things this group does over the next few years. So thank you so much. Candace. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. So um, there is a good reason that we have sequestered you for three days. Um, in what I hope is the city's equivalent of the Enchantment's core. Data camp is intended to really be base camp, right? So we've brought you here for these three days for the explicit purpose of being able to explore a lot of different things without having to go from you know, zero to 14,000 feet every day. We're already here. 
Um, and as we move through the next three days, we're going to be um, taking a lot of different trails, some of us together and some of us in smaller groups, to explore everything that is possible with our open data program. Uh, I'd like for you to first meet your Sherpas. I told Bruce not to be mad at me here. We have your open data program manager, mountain man Bruce Blood. Uh, and me, Candace Faber. <laughs> uh, and me, Candace Faber, your civic technology advocate. Um, and we are going to be here all three days if you have any questions or any needs. Um, my mobile phone number is actually on the very first page as you open up your um, booklet today. So if at any point you're confused or can't find something, you know how to reach us. Um, we're here to do most of the heavy lifting for you so that um, you feel free to explore. Um, one of the things I want to point out, because we always do, uh, is that part of taking care of you is that we're going to feed you and caffeinate you every morning. So just a little preview. You're going to have Vietnamese food for lunch today, uh, homegrown sandwiches and salads tomorrow, and knockwood, if everything works out, um, some delicious Caribbean food on Thursday to close us out with a bang. So just to give you something to look forward to. But like all good trailblazers, first we need to break the ice. So I see everyone is seated in groups. This is great. Um, go ahead and stand up. And uh, we're just going to go through a, a very simple exercise. I have a really quick question um, for you to answer. Um, and first, you're going to share with each other in a group of two, then in a group of four, and then in a group of eight. Um, and so to make that possible with, with a large number of people, um, don't use any extraneous words. Just plan to say your name, your department, and then your answer to this question as succinctly as possible. Um, so for me, I would just say Candace Faber, Seattle IT, and then how awesome it is. So quick question is, what is the one thing that you wish people understood about your department's work? Ready? All right, pairs of two, go. Okay, has everyone had a chance to work out their answer? I'm gonna move you to groups of four now. Hard to be succinct. All right, guys, now, um, I don't know, I can't really whistle. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, groups of four now, very quickly. Already done? Okay, as people are wrapping up, now this is the big test of how solid you have your messaging. Uh, if you can combine for groups of eight and do the same thing. If you have a couple extras, that's okay.
Sure. Okay, it looks like people made it all the way around. If not, let's wrap up and head back to your seats. Thank you so much for being game, everyone. Um, hopefully now you have a a little bit better sense of who your fellow travelers are on this trip we're taking the next few days. Um, before we really kick things off, I wanted to um, go over kind of what to expect for the next three days um, and lay out clearly for you what our goals are um, on the open data team um, and from Seattle IT for what we want to accomplish during the next three days. Um, so we actually have three different summits we're trying to reach. Um, and Bruce makes fun of me for the next three being woo-woo, but just go with it, because um, it's important to me. So the first goal um, that I have for this training is that you leave inspired. Um, I want everyone in this room to understand why we are doing this work. Um, I don't ever want open data to feel like something that you need to do in order to comply with a policy, um, although this is the city, so you know that's there, and there is like the big mural fist hanging off in the distance. But um, if that's the reason why we're doing things, I don't think we're going to be very excited about showing up for each other. So um, I want all of us ha to have a good sense of, of the purpose of this work. Um, I also want everyone to be able to see from your own point of view what possibilities your open data holds. Uh, it's not very scalable for me to stand here and tell you that open data is great and just trust me, the community will do awesome things with it. Um, I want each of you to look at it from your own um, vantage point and, and see what's possible. And also for you to feel like you're part of a, a larger community of open data champions here at the city, but also nationally and around the world um, because there are a lot of really exciting people working on this stuff. Goal number two is that you feel empowered. Everyone's favorite buzzword. Um, what I mean by that is that you know exactly what you need to do as an open data champion and how to do it. That you feel fully prepared to go back to your departments um, and, and oversee the process and that you can envision what it's gonna look like um, from start to next stage because it's never really finished. And finally, that you're equipped meaning that you've actually had a chance to try out a number of different tools and methodologies and approaches. So this isn't just theoretical, we're not taking you shopping at REI, but you're actually trying things on um, and taking them for, for a test run in the fields. 
We also want to make sure that you have access to all of the resources that we have here at the city, which is why we're going to be introducing you to people from a number of different departments and offices over the next three days um, who will be important resources for you, um, even above and beyond what the open data team can provide, um, such as our, our new chief privacy officer, Susan Goodman, who you'll hear from tomorrow. Um, and we also want you to know where to find additional learning opportunities and resources outside of the city. Um, while we're extremely ambitious, as always, about all of the training and goodness that we want to bring to you, um, there is immensely more um, out there than what we could ever possibly bring into the city of Seattle. So we want you to feel equipped to uh, pursue your curiosity as far as it might take you. And how we're going to get there. Um, you all have agendas in your uh, books um, that you can reference at, at any time. Um, I realized I didn't read my own joke. There's a map for that. No app, <laughs> but at the very least a printed agenda that you can consult. Um, and because it's three days and on Thursday you see a whole block of workshops, I anticipate that by Thursday you might start feeling tempted to go back down to sea level and start taking care of business. So while I'm going to go over the workshops um, in detail again on Thursday, I want to give you a little preview and maybe a couple of selling points of why we hope that you will stick around and actually complete this training. So, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Tuesday, today, we're just basically going to be mapping and scouting, going, going through like the entire process with, with an overview so you know what to expect. Uh, Wednesday, going for a, a trial run and actually walking you through the entire process of publishing a new open data set. Um, and then Thursday, this is what you've got. So the first workshop sessions will be at 10 a.m. Um, and we have two choices. Generally, as you look at this slide, like the top row um, is going to be great for people who don't have much or any prior exposure to um, data. It's not necessarily going to be boring if you do, but um, a great thing for beginners. If you feel like you already understand um, data pretty well and you want to go a little bit deeper, um, you can look at the, the workshop on the bottom. So on uh, Thursday at 10 a.m., we have an Intro to Data Science workshop being led by Bill Howe, uh, who is the uh, Associate Director of the eScience Institute at University of Washington, um, and who we work closely with on a number of programs, um, including, for those of you who maybe aren't from tech, um, the Urban at UW Interdisciplinary um, Urban Planning Program. We also have uh, basics of statistical analysis with open data. Um, someone asked at our Breakfast of Champions what R was. This is going to be a great chance to learn and explore R, if that's something that's of interest to you. Um, and it will still be pretty, um, pretty basic, so don't be intimidated um, if this is something that interests you. Um, and our leader will be Stuart Gano, who's a, a data solutions architect at Socrata. Um, and I just threw up their claims to fame. He's an Eagle Scout who played college baseball for four years. These are, are going to be fun people you want to hang out with as well. Thursday, the second uh, workshop will be at 12.30 PM. Um, the, we'll have a choice of communicating data for action and impact with Nam Ho Park, who's the West Coast Director for Forum One, um, also an architect, as well as an information architect, which I think is pretty cool. And then uh, in the afternoon, we will have uh, Chris Metcalf, who is the Developer Experience Director at Socrata. Um, they're the vendor for our open data platform, in case you don't know. And he's going to be going through the ABCs of APIs. Uh, also a guy who built two robots to compete in a desert race for DARPA. So uh, an interesting fellow. And then finally, on Thursday at 2 PM, uh, we will have Amy Ballot, who's the CEO of Killer Infographics, um, leading intro to visual communication for government. It's an awesome presentation. If you've been to Seattle Interactive Conference, you may have seen a version of this. Um, but she's going to go through really high level um, how, how you can use data for visual communication um, and really amplify the impact of your messaging. So if you're kind of on the communication side for your department, that would be a great one. Um, and then for those of you who haven't had enough of Stuart, um, we're bringing him back to do a workshop in Perspectives, which is the storytelling tool that we have licenses for um, for everyone in the city. So that's what you've got to look forward to. Um, if you make it through all the days of data camp and still have energy in the evening and want to, it's totally possible, it happens to me. Um, tomorrow there's an event at Town Hall um, called Protecting Yourself and Your Privacy in the Digital Age. It should be of interest. Um, that's a $5 public event um, and a short walk from here. So if you want to head over with a, with a crew, we'll be doing that. 
Um, and then on Thursday, after the last day, um, after a brief interlude where we plan to sneak out for happy hour, we'll be heading to the Socrata headquarters for the Open Seattle Meetup. This is the bi-monthly meetup of our um, local civic technology community, and some of your colleagues from SDOT will be presenting um, about the Vision Zero project, which you will also hear more about later this morning. So are, are there any questions about any of that stuff before I move on? No questions? It's not just people being shy? OK, great. Well, you know where to find us. So are we ready? Come on, you know I'm going to do this. Are you ready? <laughs> awesome. So next up, uh, we actually are very fortunate to have a keynote speaker this morning. You will still be able to watch Ben Wellington's TED Talk if you want. It's great. Um, but I'm really thrilled that Catherine Nikolovsky um, came up last night from Portland um, to share with us some of the work that she's doing with Hack Oregon, um, which is a Portland-based civic technology group that's doing um, some pretty incredible stuff. So I've asked Kat to come and um, really kind of give us a, that first sense of what the possibilities are with open data and kick us off right. So um, to give her a second to set up, we'll call this our next mini coffee break. So if you need the restroom, water, beverages, anything, um, now is a great time to do it. And we'll get started in about five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'm incredibly appreciative to be here today for a number of reasons. Um, one, I, 24 hours ago, had absolutely no idea about anything that was going on with Data Camp. And actually, it's been a great opportunity for me to see more deeply into what the city of Seattle is doing to pioneer open data. And uh, where I live in Portland, I've been spending a lot of time at City Hall, uh, not as successfully able to get together as many people that work across departments and bureaus uh, to actually not only just talk about open data, but to commit time to take actionable steps toward learning how to contribute. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about data and open data being the key to transparency for government. Um, of course, we need information to make good decisions. Uh, that information that exists within the city that we use to make decisions is not always the same information that the community or that the civic uh, public has to make those decisions. And increasingly, uh, to restore trust in just the democratic system when people are starting to feel disenfranchised with you know, wondering if their vote even matters, what happens to their tax dollars, uh, there really is a need and desire to want to see that. Um, so if knowledge is power, data is accountability in that way. But I'm coming sort of with one foot in civic leadership and another foot into technology and industry. And I have a bit of a controversial thought on uh, the way that open data is talked about as being transparency first with government. I actually see this as a major step forward for innovation. And for me personally, that's one of the biggest motivators that I have to uh, contribute to the open source community and work with government, because it is such a frontier that is undiscovered. Um, like. Uh, Earlier this morning, I heard somebody reference Seattle as a $500 billion uh, company? Five billion. Five, okay. That means it's a huge company. Imagine uh, any kind of private sector industry that had that type of revenue valuation. What would their data team look like? They are leveraging every single different aspect of every button click, every purchase, um, all of the ROI. All of that is data-driven, and it's not questioned. And the technologies that they use are 15 years ahead, honestly, of where most government is. Not only that, um, the way that we tend to operate inside of bureaus and departments, separated. Uh, we can all do our part individually, as we're training today, to think about opening up different data sets. But to stay, take a step back and think about the big picture, uh, it's interdepartmental. Everything is connected. Uh, the thing about data is that it can help you answer questions, but if you're doing it right, answering those questions just leads to more questions. And I'll tell you a bit about my experience working with data in Oregon and exactly what our nonprofit does and how we've learned and evolved into the organization that we are. Um, but it's been a discovery process. And at every single corner, uh, it is like 
a frontier. And so I love the whole data camp of sort of like setting off on the journey reference because that's often how it feels for us. And we're just trying to mitigate casualty and triage things and map it along the way. Um, and I suppose I'm sort of like your first field guide welcoming you to the trail to talk about all of the dangers and all of the glories. And uh, you'll have your own experiences over the next few days. And hopefully, many of you that already like open data uh, will end up with a more deep sense of how you personally are connected to it and where there's room to grow. And uh, for those of you who may be a little bit skeptical on why you are here and whether or not you even want to uh, be taking these different kinds of compliance steps, that it will actually have meaning and maybe change the way that you see it. So a bit about Hack Oregon. This is our website. So we're a nonprofit. And part of the charm, I think, is that we are operating slightly adjacent to um, industry. So we're not a for-profit driven company. But we are building real software, which is competitive with the, uh, with the industry. We're also not a department of the city or state government. Um, we, all of our technology are built, is built completely with volunteers. But we do work often with the city and with the state. And what's so fantastic about looking out at the room of all of you here today, I've never seen this many people um, that potentially are data holders that are talking about opening up data in a room all in one place. Uh, that would be like a field glory day for me in, in Portland because I know that it's so critically important to have, um, we call them context experts, um, not only on different data sets, but on what they mean. And if you're the people that use them every day, you're the best people to know the limitations. You also understand all of the circumstances surrounding the data and what it really means in terms of getting work done and the impact that it has on people. Um, if we're just a bunch of developers, let's say we're data scientists that are going to get together and do something on education, we don't really know um, what that means for kids. We're not in classrooms every day. We're not trying to do uh, some of the uh, other kinds of uh, institutional work that's helping to create policy around education. We can look at the data, but it would be like looking at somebody else's phone records. <laughs> and if you look at your own phone records, you see a couple things that are data line items. You can see your telephone number. You recognize that. You can see maybe like phone numbers um, of your sister or you know the time that you called. You look at that, you kind of say, like, oh, that's my life. That makes sense. I could track through that and help to gain some insight, maybe locations and things like that. But uh, looking at somebody else's phone records makes no sense. Uh, so what we do is look for civic topics that inspire the public to want to answer more questions and want to gain more insight. And we look for partners within the um, city and state government that actually often will come out of their own accord and meet with us just like volunteers. And the process looks like getting permission to even give us data that is really in the public domain anyhow. But it's hard to even know what's in the public domain. There are just Excel spreadsheets on people's computers. There's all different kinds of things that are data that you might not even think of, things that are on paper, things that are historic records, things that we wouldn't even know existed without the participation of the people working inside of these departments. And so it's critical to have them in the group. But I think that what um, inspires all of this to happen is that um, we have um, software engineers, we have designers, we have journalists often, or storytellers. Um, that are all sort of like equally professional citizens that say, hey, like if we come together, um, I'll lend my type of professional skill if you give me yours. And together, through all of this, we'll come up with something that's completely new because we're not actually, as a nonprofit, and we operate independently, uh, we're not accountable to making that monetized in the way that a venture capital uh, funded business might need to do. Um, we are not government, so also we can be a little bit more flexible with the types of style guides and perspectives that we can put on things, but we also keep it really unbiased. So before I go any further, I sort of thought that I would show you a video so you can hear some voices and see um, a bit of the perspectives, and I'll give you some more details after we're done.
First, I want to welcome everyone again to the Shirley Pepe Forum, which is the uh, part of the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication here in Portland. In this particular build a -thon, you know, we actually brought together a, a planning session uh, where we engage with the larger public to think about and to explore what are the needs of not just Portland, but also across the state. To me, the purpose of data visualization is to build evidence towards the stories that we're telling of the community. These are game changers. Like I would say in the room right now, we have projects that are going to be a part of how we view our city for a long time. I'm a big, big fan of collaboration. I love interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary teams because I think it has great, fresh perspectives on the issue. Um, I know that as an urbanist, there's only so far I can go and I have to really rely on some great coders, some great data, um, and journalists to come in and kind of add a new layer to it. Putting people in a room from the private sector, who people who are really good at design and development, um, coding problems, and the same room as the journalists who always want to, you know, tell the truth and get civic engagement, and um, government officials. You know, right there are, are three completely different fields, often trying to accomplish the same goal. One of the most valuable pieces of advice, pieces of advice that I ever got when it came to journalism, is that you know, if your mom tells you she loves you, get it in writing. And so that's a lot of what we're doing right here, right now, is we, you know, instead of waiting for public officials to tell us the state of things or to uh, hand over any particular pieces of data for us to report on, we're looking for it ourselves. So the final outcome of this build-a-thon, we intentionally left it open-ended, but I suspect, as with most of these digital solutions, a lot of the outcomes will be around a digital output. I've always wanted to find a way to do something um, community oriented that would still use my skill set. Something that wasn't just, you know, lending my helping hands to some physical labor project, but something that would take my professional skills and let me apply them to something that would give back to the community. And so I was really excited to have this chance. Okay, so uh, what you were looking at in that video was an event that we did last year. It was a full three-day event, and uh, it was held at the University of Oregon School of Journalism. And in that room, it was about 70 people for all three days, and we're talking like 14, 16-hour days, so we pretty much locked ourselves in there. And um, the idea was that we were going to actually come out of those three days with five projects that were going to be full-scale, um, interactive uh, software pieces that would give insight on, um, they're data-driven on different themes for our community. And so we've continued this and expanded the season out to be twice yearly, which we have volunteers apply to participate across different disciplines. And um, we will build together for five months. And I'm talking to you in an interesting time because uh, the end of our season is coming up in about two weeks. And so the things that we've been working on for the last five months, I have some examples of. Um, and we are uh, heading into some pretty interesting territory that we've done this a number of times. We've repeated themes and we've started to see how a lot of these themes are starting to really blur the lines between um, what you might think of as particular categories. So to give you an idea of the scale of Hack Oregon in general, um, we had 500 applications, a little bit more, for, to participate in a volunteer season which could take 100 people. And so we split those 100 people up into five different groups, and they each meet once a week in the evening in the basement of the Science Museum. Um, and that will include people from the city. Um, so we have themes on um, education, we have a theme on urban development, we have a theme this year on campaign finance transparency, and a theme on um, agriculture, and a theme on hunger in Oregon. And so 
Those teams are made up of software engineers, they're made up of designers, they're made up of journalists, and they're made up of context experts. And so we'll go through a design thinking process that includes everyone from start to finish. It doesn't matter if you're an engineer or you've never been exposed to design training, maybe working with the city. But um, we find that it's a pivotal piece of um, starting out every project because the very place that you start with modeling data and what you're collecting and how you are leveraging that to um, ask questions is going to be very connected to your end result. And so something else that we've found, I'm not going to talk on this too much um, during the talk, but if you want to ask questions later, uh, is the training. So we have uh, about half of our group will be experts. Um, so people who um, are highly competitive assets within the technology industry, um, designers that work at top agencies, or they're people who are you know, just like you, working in government. And then there's a lot of people who are looking to learn. We call them juniors, and we put them all through training. So the training that we offer is, at scale, 15 different classes to correspond to 15 different roles that we need on each team. So these teams are about 20 people each. And so you imagine that this is like a pop-up company um, overnight just to work on civic data problems um, for Oregon. And the scale of that is a little bit incredible because you think about how much work and how many man hours it really takes and different perspectives to achieve just one project. And so it becomes even more ridiculous to think about yourselves in this position where if you feel like you, um, you know, are creating open data one data set at a time alone, it's not the case. If you look around this room, you guys are all really a type of team. Um, and there's a huge amount of support from the open source community in particular or people that have other kinds of technology skills that once the data is available and accessible, they will step in to help um, to be able to take it farther. And so a key point of why I'm participating in open data as a, um, as a nonprofit is because I believe that this is an interesting route to innovation that really is not I don't see a clear path to it being uh, accomplished just through allocating funding through the city to be able to hire the types of people who can build these things. Um, this is truly a, uh, it involves the entire city. It involves, like it's open source is very global. Um, I'll give you an example of something that happened just this last season. We're doing a project on education, as I mentioned, and a project on hunger. and. That, at first, they don't seem like they're totally related. Um, what we ended up doing was a, uh, the first aggregate statewide study in the country that um, was looking at the link between after-school programming and summer school programming and performance. So the reason that there had not been a statewide study before on uh, the effects of programming and performance is because no one knew where the schools were that had expanded programming. And to some of you in this room, that might actually sound familiar and not surprising. To some of you, it might be very surprising. It was absolutely surprising to me. Um, not just that Oregon didn't have this, but that it didn't exist at all. So the way that we ended up finding out where all of the different schools were is that we were working with a nonprofit that had an Excel spreadsheet that they had been keeping for years. Uh, they're called Oregon Ask. They're Oregon After School Kids. Uh, it's part of a national network, but they had been for years calling schools on the phone and keeping Excel records of uh, exactly what type of programming that were there. And I'm talking about not like sports programming, this is academic based programming. And they have been uh, fighting for funding to get programming into schools, especially in low income neighborhoods. It's not uniformly funded at all by the state or by the federal government. And so the nonprofit existed to patchwork these grants together. And that's how they had the records, because they're deeply involved with the schools. And as they had been trying to make a case to get better funding to actually do more to uniformly, uh, unifun, un, more unilaterally fund, um, fund these programs, they're on the legislature floor um, with principals, with teachers, giving anecdotal, heartfelt stories about how this is helping their school. But um, people who might not want to fund these programs 
could easily hear that and say, well, that's your story. But that may not be true in all cases. Um, it would really help to have something that's more comprehensively data-driven to, to stand behind those anecdotes. And so uh, we took on the project. And we uh, discovered that, yes, uh, we're about to release this as a report, but uh, there is a link that we found between, it's positive, uh, looking at the presence of programming across reading, math, and science, and uh, performance, especially in those districts that are um, experiencing high amounts of poverty. And that also is probably not a surprise for you to hear that, hey, having expanded reading programs after school is going to help kids with early literacy? Yes, <laughs> but now that we have the data, it does something different to the conversation, and it empowers the possibility of actually seeing these things funded um, in a way that just was not there before. And so really the only way that this study happened was because of people from the tech community, people from government, and nonprofits coming together, including using a whole like bunch of in, or resources through universities and kind of other teaching things to train people how to even participate because I'll tell you a secret, these technologies are teachable, but they're not necessarily easy. Even for the tech industry right now, the things that we need to do to lead cutting edge data stories are not necessarily ubiquitous. <clears throat> so uh, the story doesn't really end there at all. <laughs> so. I mentioned that we had another project on hunger that we were doing, a theme. So completely different team, different group of experts, and they're meeting on different nights of the week. So these teams don't really know each other too well. Uh, we have a few staff that go in between and see all the projects. And so as we get this eagle eyes view, uh, what we started looking at was, so with, with Oregon and hunger, I'll set the stage here. Oregon has one of the highest rates of food insecurity in the entire country. Um, Oregon actually looks very different from Washington. Um, even though we're a Northwest region, a lot of times Oregon and Washington are compared. Um, we have much, much more food insecurity. And if you were to ask the question, who's affected by this most, it's clearly, clearly children and young children. Uh, there are different reasons for that, but uh, Oregon doesn't like to think of itself that way, and it's a hard reality to face when you're looking at the numbers. And the solution is not easy. I mean, we have over 900 food relief agencies in the state, and there's a lot of money that's spent administratively on trying to solve the hunger problem. And year over year, it's the same result. It looks bad. I mean, we're kind of in, if you look at the map, the data looks like we are almost in the southwest regions like Mississippi, Alabama, whether Oregon's number one or number four, it just has to do with other states doing worse or better. It doesn't have to do with our numbers changing. And we do have um, one of the most highly used uh, food benefit SNAP um, programs as well. So uh, that project, we were a little stumped. We found that there was a huge amount of data out there but there were so many different agencies, um, all focusing on a little piece of it, that there was no big picture to be tied together. And the context experts there were stumped a little bit themselves, too. So we would look at a project um, that we, so we did a project the year before, which was looking at self-sufficiency. So we had a pretty sensitive algorithm to look at region by region cost of living and where people would be self-sufficient um, if you looked at the entire population that was vulnerable to um, minimum wage, single, um, single parents with multiple children, and places and regions that had higher populations of multiple children, single parents, and it, there's different kinds of thresholds, um, you would look at that and say, like, well, there's a uh, lack of self-sufficiency in the area but it didn't map to food insecurity. So places that we knew economically were not self-sufficient were actually not as vulnerable to the severe types of child hunger um, that other places were. And, so, and then we also looked at things like longevity and lifespan. County to county can be very different because of access to uh, um, health resources, lots of things. That didn't map either. 
And so we went back and we started realizing, well, we were actually creating a calculator that was sort of factoring in a bunch of these costs. And one thing that no one had factored in yet were these places that had expanded programming had expanded meal programs. So that's worth about $2 per meal. And so if you have two children that are in a school system, you're looking at 10 meals a week for an after school program. And then you're looking at during the summer, losing everything. And so you could actually be losing three meals a day per child for the entire summer. And so once we started to factor in where that money was going, where there were children in the area, where there were schools that were serving meals, that was like the skeleton key that unlocked everything. So not only did we end up, have, end up having something which is fairly you know, landmark and important, which is this aggregate study that even showed a link between the presence of programming and performance, we then found that this had a region-wide impact on hunger. And so you can see, as you start to ask questions of data, um, and then if you do a good job, it, you just end up with more. All of a sudden, something that we thought was a pretty clear result, like literacy programs equals higher reading scores, maybe it's the food. How, how much can you really begin to, um, to untangle these things? And so then the question becomes, well, if this was an internal government project, is we're sort of working with the Department of Health and the Department of Education. There's not a huge amount of ease trying to take these huge systems and work together to create change just because of a report. I mean, you'd think that sometimes information will change things once you know about it, but the truth is we've sort of felt a lot of these things for a long time. And when data sometimes confirms instinct but also sometimes uh, tells you something that you don't want to see, the important thing is that it strikes uh, a nerve of being real. And the beauty of this project is that it's not an internal government project. We have built an entire application which is supposed to be for the public to help understand this issue. And it doesn't make any claims to how we're gonna solve it, but once we understand some of the challenges better, then we can begin to discuss what solutions are. They seem more possible. And, um, it's harder to go away when the public grabs a hold of it. Because when you see something like that, you don't unsee it. And like I said, many people that live in Oregon don't really know about, especially in Portland, don't really know about the 37,000 children that don't know if they're gonna get breakfast or lunch um, during the summer season. That's, you know, our neighborhoods that we're not looking at. And, uh, but when you see that, it becomes real and um, it's a little bit harder to turn away from. So thinking about really what value is and comparing this back again to, to the tech industry and the way that things are evaluated. Uh, venture capital right now is powering an awful lot of what our talent is doing with data science. Uh, but for some of these projects, they really don't have a venture-backed reason to exist, like this one. And sometimes you really don't even know what the value is gonna be until you do the project. And on the other hand, um, when it comes to government and procurement, if that's our other option of building this kind of civic technology, it takes a really, really long time. And even if we had the money at the government civic level to double this room and put people just on open data, competing for talent in the economy that we're in, it's impossible. Uh, we, don't we don't really have the tradition quite now to even keep up with the type of iterative, highly like, uh, just specialized environment which is creating a lot of the new cutting edge technology. Uh, so what do we do? Hack Oregon is demonstrating that the people who are getting paid $200,000 a year to work at these companies and who have been trained and have a lot of uh, you know, value within the tech community building these projects which do have venture-backed reasons to exist, um, feel a little bored with not solving the kinds of problems that they feel like are all around us. And so I think that more than anything else, 
whether it's design or whether it's software engineering, and there's a whole bunch of spectrums of tech specialties, uh, most of all, people are wanting to solve problems that are important. And so our city and our government has an awful lot of them and just a gold mine waiting to be uncovered. And it's an incredibly exciting thing to get together and feel like, hey, who values this the most? It's really us as a group. And so thinking about yourself as a uh, city employee versus thinking about yourself as a citizen, sometimes uh, step outside of our roles a little bit to see the bigger picture. And I am absolutely positive with the experience that I have. Like, I'm basically in the trenches right now. I'm not just keynoting, you know, based on like a lot of intellectual thought that I've put into even my talk today on very short notice, but every single person in this room that I see, I can find you 10 engineers that would take the knowledge that you have with the data sets that you have access to in your neighborhood that will show up for months to work on making that something that public can access um, because we know that there's value there. And the funny thing is, and I believe, that when we start to build products and we start to think about data from that standpoint, that all of a sudden we have a very new kind of value. You know, there's kind of a joke right now in Silicon Valley that you go to a restaurant and everybody's talking about building restaurant apps. And I wonder how valuable really something like that is if kids aren't getting food on the table. I don't, I'm not romanced by the idea of technology for the culture of you know, cuteness and usability is certainly very important, but um, utility is something else to think about. Um, I'm reminded, especially with all of this talk about uh, being on the, the trail and being at camp, that the Northwest is a special place even compared to um, California. And on the Oregon Trail, and we use a lot of Oregon Trail metaphors at Hack Oregon. <laughs> Our facilitators or product managers are called wagon masters. Uh, that people had made it all the way across, you know, having left Massachusetts, and then they get that, that option. Do you go north or do you go south? The people that went south were looking for the gold rush. And that's that big 10x return, that's that venture capital, that's that restaurant app that turns into a multi-million dollar company. Um, quick and easy and sexy and fun. And the Northwest, I think the people that went north were looking for a quality of life. And they're looking for something that is going to have long-term value. And so that's why I see this culture of inclusion that we have and knowing that here in Seattle, we have all of these developers and all of these designers and that you yourselves, there's the possibility that we can come together, work slightly outside the system, and actually get it done. We'll be leading the rest of the country because not everybody has a perspective like that. And it's happening in Oregon. Uh, I'll give you a few more examples of things uh, like value that can just play with your idea a little bit of what really takes time and what really takes money. So the, the video that you saw there um, in that three-day event, we did five projects, and one of them I'll show to you, if we can pull up the Aftershock. So uh, this is a, uh, an app that we built. It actually lives on opb.org, which is our, um, like our NPR station for Oregon. And this started with a conversation that we were having about just things that were important to Oregon and talking about the Cascadia earthquake was certainly something that is an important topic. And huge amounts of data. I mean, so uh, Dogami is our geological mineral research um, government-funded entity. And we were talking to some of the top seismic researchers in the state of Oregon, and just immaculately kept databases by researchers. I mean, pretty much for every single square meter of ground, we've got data on it a million ways from Sunday. Uh, the problem was all of those databases were separate. Um, it would take a scientist, if you were to drop a pin on a map, uh, what would all of those factors combined contribute to your scenario um, if there was a 9.0 off the coast of Oregon? Uh, it's calculable, we know it, but it would take time, it would take an expert. And then there's this other thing about the preparedness manual, that's 900 pages. 
So for every factor that you calculate, you've got to go reference the 900-page preparedness manual. Uh, it's kind of impossible to think about how a citizen would be able to prepare for that scenario. But the data is absolutely available. I mean, it's online. The preparedness manual is meant for people. But how do you know what to do? So he had, um, uh, the, one of the lead researchers had pitched to Dogami uh, $100,000 and a year to build something which would connect the databases and reference the, um, the preparedness manual based on the, um, the metrics. And they turned him down. They didn't think it was worth it or maybe it was too expensive. Actually, it's very, I think that that's a little bit cheap if you were to really book that out with an agency. But uh, for whatever reason, it couldn't get done and there was no other path, that, that's the end. So when we heard about that, we said, well, would you spend three days with us and help us understand what we're looking at here? And at first, he didn't think that it was possible that we were gonna be able to get anything done because three days of his time is worth quite a lot. Um, but uh, we did get a team together and we built this in three days for the cost of food and shelter for the volunteers. It was three like 14 hour days, but all the same. He said at the end of it that this was actually better than what they could have built in a year with $100,000. And one of the reasons for that is that if they would have built it internally, it would have looked like it was built for researchers. And this is a program that really feels like you're kind of talking to an audience and it's really built for engagement. We've had over a million page views. We've been linked from um, The New Yorker to this website. Um, it's very widely used and not just in Oregon because we open source all of the code. It means that every single thing that we build, just like this program, can be replicated with new data um, that serves the state. Somebody else might want something like this and they're free to change it or use as much of this program as, the, as they want to. So what we're doing in Oregon um, can help to pave the way for what is going on in Seattle. And I'm absolutely hoping that um, what you are doing here in terms of the participation in the government will actively help um, my work in, in Oregon because we're not quite as far along um, with the city of Portland making the investment, stepping up to train the folks like you and, and even just yourselves of being here. Um, it's, it's really something that's incredible even if it doesn't feel like it or if you don't realize it now. Um, I might not demo this, but you can find that pretty easily online. I'll probably open it up to questions pretty soon, but let's see if there's anything else. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is one more example. Um, and this is the idea of, I think, uh, the high standards that people have about technology. And many citizens, if you ask them, um, they feel like somewhere out there, somebody has all of the information perfectly at their fingertips. The people who are making decisions for our city, they have the information they know. And when you see things that um, you have such a high standard for just like the, the appeal of tech products these days, um, there's a lot of judgment if things don't look quite right. And so when government websites look out of date, you can be judged very, very harshly. So I'll give you an example of something very simple <laughs> and silly. Um, there, we were building our campaign finance transparency app. It's called Behind the Curtain, which shows a lot of different metrics of things that are going on behind the scenes with campaign finance activity. It's all local as well, um, so it's not quite like what you might have seen on some of the Sunlight Foundation or uh, followthemoney.org. Um, we thought that one of the major things that people might want to do with this site would be to type in their address and then see everyone who would be on their ballot so that they can begin their research from there. Well, that turned out to be a huge problem because there's not something um, called a central spatial database. So that, again, that pin on a map, all of the different types of districts that overlap that one pin, which might be different from three blocks down the road. So we're talking about school board, legislature, there's all kinds of things that people don't even really think of as being districts. There was not a place at the state of Oregon where all of this was kept together. And at first, like, we didn't believe it. We just, we just thought that, um, well, we don't have access to it and no one wants to give us access to it, which made the most sense. 
But actually, I ended up being able to talk to the Secretary of State's office quite a bit about this and chasing down the question, they didn't know. And so this really got kicked pretty far up the train and people started asking like, yeah, how do we print the voter pamphlet? If we did. So uh, the answer to the question is, uh, we found somebody, I like to call her Betty, but that's not her real name. Uh, Betty in the printer's office, who literally prints the, uh, the voter file. She will call up some of these rural counties, um, talking to other Betty on the phone, like, oh, hey, she's the wife of the retired fire chief, since they've been doing this since well before internet. And she'll get precinct codes and addresses and define the boundaries of these districts. It takes months. This is her job. She's the only one that knows how to do this. And it is the most inefficient, really awful way that you could imagine printing off voter pamphlets. And then the printer just gets wiped at the end of all of it. We just start over for the next election. Um, to rebuild that database, it would take uh, committee, lobbying. We have to go through all of these different things. Maybe we get the money and probably underbid it. I really think to build something like this, we'd be looking at people traveling out. Huge contract, well over a million dollars for something like this. And when we have the pamphlet that's still getting printed, election cycle after election cycle, does that become a priority? Um, this is something that is not seen as an open data issue. Um, it's a very literal infrastructure issue, but at the same time, if people don't know easily who's going to be on their ballot, that makes it really hard to uh, participate in a primary. We've all had the experience of going to the ballot and just voting party line or really not knowing, and you blame yourself for having not Googled it. Like if I would have only Googled anything ahead of time. But actually, you can't. There is nowhere to go to get that information. And that's not your fault. This, and it's also an expensive, complicated thing to fix. But I know that if we were to get together a group um, of people who can build a spatial database, they'd absolutely build that. It's not actually that much. Um, we could take road trips. It would be fun. We can get to know Betty and uh, you know, lock ourselves in a room for another three days, and we'd probably come out with it. Would this be good enough for the Secretary of State's office to actually use and rely on for um, printing voter pamphlets? I mean, in terms of tech, the answer is maybe, but it takes maintenance. But this is an example of how you can kind of get around that process of limitation by having it just appear. If you work with the open source community, and don't think of it as a scary thing, but you think of it as really participating in innovation, um, all of a sudden these things can get built. And it's then a choice whether you use them or it's much less expensive to replicate them or to create a contract um, or an RFP around how to um, integrate that back in. Uh, we could take a lot of the R&D out, and I think that the citizens actually really want to participate. And so every data set that you open up, that is just fuel for the fire. And if you want to get more involved and really think about, like, well, now that I've put the data set out there, what do I do with it? How do we make this engaging? You probably all have questions of your own, and you're just like everyone else in that regard. And so find somebody else, different talents, and there's a very rich data open source community in Seattle, so we're in a great place for it. And if there's anything that from you know, my trenches in Oregon that can help, um, I'm looking forward to a continued relationship with the city of Seattle as we move forward in the Northwest leading the entire nation on open source and government transformation. Thank you. I was wondering if you could speak a little about the, uh, the role that Hack Oregon plays both in uh, translating data into uh, public policy and program implementation and also providing uh, the data that you uncover in a way that's contextually meaningful for the public when oftentimes it's very sort of specialized or niche data. Okay, I think that's two questions. I can answer one of those 
pretty easily um, with a story I just learned. So we made a product called Raise Effect, which um, was when Oregon was considering raising minimum wage. Um, the question was to, you know, thinking about the legislature, well, where did these numbers come from? Are they going to raise it to $13 an hour or $13.50 or $15 an hour? And it was very contentious because of the difference of cost of living in Portland versus other rural areas. And uh, we built something that broke that down incrementally. Um, it was a slider, and you could kind of like really see based on population that was vulnerable to the poverty, like um, how how the uh, self-sufficiency effect might be if it was raised. And then we, we're working so much just to get these projects done. We release it. We really didn't do any promotion of it at all. Um, but we knew that there were some, we have key relationships. I think it's those internal relationships of the people who do care. We rely on those. And we ended up seeing that Oregon passed a tiered minimum wage raise. Uh, which was so close to what our actual analysis was that I thought either they've got a great data scientist or they somehow used this. But I didn't follow up on it too much um, until just recently I talked to a state legislator who had gotten, uh, sh the program got sent to her email. And then she called the Speaker of the House in the middle of the night. She said it hit the chambers the next day, changed everything. And she's on record saying that this 100% was something that they used, that the outcome may have been very different if it was not for this program. And so the quietness of that kind of impact where I didn't even know, it just happened. I think that there was something powerful about that because it was so neutral. I thought that we had actually isolated the advocates and isolated the people who were more on the conservative side and it fit no one because it didn't advocate for anything. Um, but I think that that's actually the reason that it worked. And so. As we start to get more used to open data um, influencing policy, as open source communities doing this kind of research maybe are more credible, and certainly the public interest, on the other hand, um, makes a difference. There's other stories I could tell about things that would have gotten ignored but didn't because of the public and didn't go away. Do we have time for another one? Are they in the back? on yes um, did you run into government concerns with the applications becoming abandoned where with um, the development happening but then not being maintained and also did you run into problems with the developers who come to you being versed in modern code and the government infrastructure running on hieroglyphics <laughs> so that so at they the, could at the current use moment, the <laughs> At the current moment, we are looking to pull data out, and we're managing it completely on our own system, so we're not integrating it into the .gov website. I think that actually might be happening in the fall. But what we would do is just probably put in widgets or visualizations that are dynamic, that are connected to databases that are not maintained by the government but we would open source those APIs. I mean, we're actually hoping that the APIs that we even have out right now might be very useful for the government to um, use. We can kind of like get, we can pull all the data out in a way and create this open source infrastructure that wraps around the government. And so at the point when they decide to use it, um, they can maybe do some kind of a service layer in between. They could actually really have a lot of government running on open source. Or they can just take that as R&D and then internalize it and change some things and make it specific to what they want. Because that blend of what the public wants and what the government wants, is they are a little different and deserve you know, separate work. But it, it's an option, at least. Okay. Thanks, Kat. Thank you. So we're going to... Um, we're going to take another five minutes, get your coffee, uh, then we have the panel that I'm leading coming up next, um, and we're going to do a little setup on that. See you in a minute. Um, if you have more questions for Kat, she is going to stick around for lunch. Um, so if you want to hang out in this room and talk more about the project she was describing, I encourage you to do so. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments because, um, as I was just saying to Kathy, uh, 
there's always a lot of confusion about who I am and what my title is. Um, I get called like the data advocate, the open data advocate, this or that. Um, I'm actually the civic technology advocate, and I'm really excited that Kat showed you a little bit of what civic technology is and what that means. Um, we're you know, building out this open data program, not just for its own sake, but so that we can engage this really robust community that we have here around building things that are of use both to government and to the public, um, and ideally accomplishing both of those things at once. So um, I'm really excited that we got a chance to be exposed to that this morning and just wanted to underscore um, one other thing she said that I think is very true here. Um, recently, we did a hackathon that's not represented on this panel um, that was 41 cities around the world called Fish Hackathon, coordinated by the State Department. Um, and the focus was on overfishing and sustainable fishing. When we did our wrap-up phone call, we discovered that Seattle had had the largest hackathon of any city. Um, and our colleagues from San Francisco said something interesting. They were like, well, you've got this prize out there, but people in the Bay Area can win $75,000 in one weekend just by going to a hackathon. So why would they show up for this? I mean, how could you really expect us to get more than 10 people? And I thought, you know, we had 60 people with an event that we put together in about three weeks. That's the kind of community that we get to work with here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, people who will, for no real hope of a financial reward, show up just because they're excited about contributing to their city and their community. And so that's a lot of what you're going to be able to hear about today. Um, we have an extraordinary panel of people who um, are working on projects, some within the city, but largely also um, with the community, examples from right here in Seattle of ways that we've engaged. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce Blood, who's going to moderate um, and take us into the 11.30 session. All right, thanks. Thanks, Candace. Um, I'm really happy to be here with these folks because um, they will, the idea here is to talk about things that we have done so far that have actually had some real impact. And each one of these folks has had been involved with uh, something like that. I'm going to start with my my counterpart at the state of Washington, this is Will Saunders. Go ahead and introduce yourself. We'll be passing microphones. I don't need a microphone, but you know, the television does. <laughs> so I'm Will Saunders. I'm the open data guy for the state of Washington. I work for the state CIO down in Olympia. Uh, and in the last year or so, or in the last two years, we've been kind of rebooting uh, the state's commitment to open data, which has in fact been in place since 2009, 2010. We've been uh, using data.wa.gov since then, and of course we've been doing transparency since at least the early 70s. So the approach that I've taken with the open data movement in Olympia is that it's not an initiative, it's not really a, a fun program, it's just part of how we do business. We focus on sustainable and progressive uh, practices, so open data is just one part of how we do government. Um, and that's been fairly successful. It's a slower pace, but we do it within existing resources. We focus on making information available amongst agencies and to partners outside of government. Um, most recently, I've been working on a couple of things, one of them being privacy. If you don't know what's private, you don't know what you can publish. And conversely, if you know what you can publish, you also know what to protect. The less you have to protect, the safer you can be. The other thing that I've seen recently, the trend that I've seen evolving, is complaints um, and rulemakings. So public commentary, public complaints um, are an offshoot or uh, an aspect of licensing, which is an, uh, one thing that the state does in spades. We license everything. Um, but for every time that there's a license, the reason that there is a license is because people are concerned about how things happen. And when a license holder is not following the way that people expect things to happen, then there are complaints. Complaints are investigated by boards and commissions. Boards and commissions produce recommendations that are implemented by operations agencies, which in turn affect uh, licenses. I don't want to take too much time, but those are two trends I've seen in the last year. One, two. No, I don't think so. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. My name is Ayala Dagni. I'm the IT director for uh, Parks and Recreation, um, part of uh, Seattle IT. I'm excited to be here today as part of the hackathon that we had um, a few a few months ago now, right? Um, which was really wonderful, and that was the first uh, introduction for me to really in in a in a um, in a, in a meaningful way. 
Um, actually, you said to make it uh, short, and then uh, we'll come back, right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mark Bridge. I'm the data-driven program lead for the Seattle Police Department. Uh, the two mm -hmm. central initiatives that I've been involved in and probably going to talk about here today our CSTAT, which is the department's crime and accountability meeting. Uh, we hold that bi-weekly, and we prioritize what the department's working on, and we bring in our city partners, our government agencies in the community to kind of discuss that. As well, we've also recently in the last, I think, six to eight months have stood up our public crime dashboard that we've published on our website to be able to share data and information with the community to engage in conversation. Hi, um, I'm Dana Chathui. I'm the um, SDOT IT director in Trump. Um, I come from a GIS background, and I'm here to uh, talk a little bit about our participation in Hack the Commute, which was in March 2015. Hi, my name is Jim Curtin with the Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, I lead uh, the city's Vision, Near Vision Zero initiative, which is um, the city's plan to eliminate serious injuries and fatalities uh, that occur on our, uh, in regard to uh, transportation by the year 2030. Uh, we're a data-driven program, and data helps guide where we uh, focus our investments and um, helps us determine which types of uh, facilities are needed to address some of the collision problems that we see on our streets. Uh, today I'll uh, talk about a number of different uh, initiatives that we have going on to help us with that, including um, our bicycle and pedestrian safety analysis, uh, our work with um, uh, DataKind and Microsoft as well. We recently held a, a data dive, which I guess is kind of the same thing as a hackathon, but with a little slightly different name, uh, to, to really crunch uh, our numbers and uh, try to figure out exactly uh, what's happening out on our streets. Thanks. Mark, I'd like to start with you. Could you let us know um, a little bit more about CSTATS and then how the uh, crime dashboard came about and um, sort of what went into that a little bit? Sure. So a little background on CSTAT, and I encourage any of you, if you haven't done so, to visit the, um, the SPD's website. We have a page just on CSTAT as well as it'll lead you to our crime dashboard. So a lot of good information there. Um, CSTAT was a request at Chief O'Toole. When she first came on board, she wanted a ComStat style process for those that, of you that are not familiar, which is police agencies usually use to come together and discuss um, priorities and data and crime using statistics to kind of help them guide what they're focusing on. So we set up CSTAT. It'll be two years this August, actually. And in doing so, um, the first thing we really had a challenge with was having a single data source to have a discussion around. When I first came to the department almost two and a half years ago, there's a lot of different data sets, a lot of different ways to pull and look at data, and rightfully so, depending on the question being asked. But we needed to have a single conversation and get away from you know, who pulled the data and what query did they use and what did they include and exclude. So we really took the time to think about what it is we were trying to address and we wanted to standardize that data and then bring it up and have a good conversation. So we worked on that in the first couple of months and CSTAT started to develop. Uh, the chief wanted to bring all the different units and divisions and sections together and make sure we knew uh, collectively as a department what we wanted to focus on and identify issues that maybe we weren't aware of. So. A lot of value came out of it. Um, we like to tell the anecdote when the, when the chief came on board, she went around and visited all the precincts and was asking how crime was in the community and what complaints were, were coming from the citizens, and we heard a lot of different feedback. And when we pulled the data together, it didn't necessarily match up with what we were hearing. So that was really a good indication of how important it was that we are having uh, the same conversation citywide because we're a city first. We don't live in isolated precincts or neighborhoods, um, although that's important to folks. Uh, we needed to have a department-wide plan. So thus began the standardization of data. Uh, the one thing we needed to do is it was becoming pretty burdensome for, for just me and on my shoulders to put data together every two weeks to host these meetings. And I was doing it manually when I first came on board because it was the only option we had. So we sat down with some of our IT folks and we started to build out dashboards and come up with a way that we could automate 80% of what we were doing. Um, in doing that, it not only was it helpful for reducing the workload and prepping this meeting every two weeks, but it was making the data available to everyone across the department anytime they needed it, and they didn't have to call or tap on my shoulder. 
we started inviting community members to see stat and sharing the information and talking about the different tactics and strategies we were deploying. And kind of what ended up happening there was people instantly wanted the internal dashboard that we had built. They said, how do I get that information? How, how do we get that out? And you know, the first version we built, it was behind our firewall. It was secure. We had added on to an application. We already had it internally. So that became problematic to face public. So right away, we knew we need to build a version of this public. So really, a lot of this came out of using the data in CSTAT. We are already, and still to this day, post our PowerPoint slides, which I, I dearly want to get away from as soon as possible. And it's been our goal in 2016 to actually fade all of that out as we make more of the data interactive and build out uh, mostly dashboards, just because it, it allows information to be more readily available to the people's hands that need it. And they're not dependent on you know, finding someone in my office to answer a question most of the time. So uh, we continued to go down that road. And we decided to use um, a separate application to build a public-facing dashboard that not exactly mirrored, but it did have the exact same data and feed and query that we use internally to look at our crime data. So we really were having the same conversation internal that we were about to share external. So um, we built that. We still publish the slides to this day to show the community what we cover every two weeks, just kind of high level the conversation that we're having. And we ended up um, using Tableau software. Just It was just our preference at the time of what we could get it done with, and it's been fantastic. Uh, we ended up uploading those internal queries externally, and right now we publish that data on a monthly basis. We do that manually. We'd like to get it automated, but just because some of the internal systems and processes that we have, which I'm sure some of you guys deal with as well, uh, we need to make sure our data is ready and it's complete before it goes out. And unfortunately, we can't pick a date of the week that we can trust that. It's a lot of manual checking in and making sure all the reports are in and everything's been transcribed and there's nothing sitting from the online reporting. and. And once we're comfortable with that, then we refresh. I think one of the, the more innovative things that I've seen, even through the other agencies I've worked with, um, is that we actually replace all the data. You know, crime data is not static. It, it's very dynamic. It refreshes. We have things that come in after the fact that they happen. We reclassify them depending on, you know, investigations. So we don't have this single truth. And if you look at our data and it changes next month, rightfully so, so every month we go back and we replace the data going back to 2008, which is when our current system came online. We refresh the whole thing and we pull it back up and we allow that system to update because we want to have that conversation and we make sure we have the most up-to-date information that we can. So that's kind of how it started. Um, it's been great. I think up to date we've had uh, over 50,000 views. And not only has it helped engage the community in conversation, but we get a lot of public disclosure requests. And it's been fantastic for media outlets and, and people that we can point uh, to, to our dashboard to go get the answers maybe they want. And uh, of course, people always want more and are very interested um, in, in what else we can put out there. But I think it's been a, a great place to start. And uh, we're excited about continuing to expand that dashboard and add additional data sets. Thanks, Mark. Jim, I'm going to pass it over to you. Um, tell us what you think um, going forward, you know, how you're going to be using data and for, you know, hopefully open data as well, and what the uh, what the value of that is going to be to your project. Yeah, I, I think there's uh, the sky's the limit actually as to as to what kind of insights the data is going to be able to uh, provide for the Seattle Department of Transportation. So we have pretty massive uh, amount of data, which is actually mostly generated by the Seattle Police Department whenever there's a collision. A uh, police officer responds, fills out a police report, and that contains a wealth of information that we then code and get into um, a database, and uh, it allows us to kind of crunch uh, uh, the, the different attributes to find out what's contributing to crashes, where they're occurring, and uh, you know what we can potentially do about it. Uh, every year, there's more than 10,000 crashes on our street. That's you know 30 to 33 per day. Um, and uh, one thing that we, we've noticed over the years with the trends is that uh, since, I don't know, about 2004 or so, uh, safety for drivers ha and passengers uh, in vehicles has improved really significantly. Um, but for people who are more vulnerable, people who are walking and biking, uh, the, same has, it, it, the same trend is not true. In fact, um, crashes involving people walking and biking make up about 5% of total crashes, but 50% of fatalities. So they're way overrepresented in our data. We have thousands of intersections in the city of Seattle, and we're, I think, really excited about 
uh, the direction we're heading right now with the data. Uh, so it started out with um, <clears throat> what we call our pedestrian and bicycle safety analysis, which I'll refer to as the BPSA. Um, and uh, essentially what it is, it's a retrospective look at um, uh, the crash data involving pedestrians and bicyclists uh, since 2007. And that's when our data got reliably good in 2007. So that's why we're slicing the data that way. Um, and essentially, um, we're looking at the different factors that are occurring. So we're looking at all these different variables in the location where these crashes occurred. And what we hope will come out of this is uh, some sort of a predictive model so that we can say, at this particular location where we have steep slopes, you know, certain types of land uses, um, you know, different uh, uh, vehicular speeds and vehicular, vehicular volumes, we're seeing this type of crash here. We also see that similar situation going on at these other intersections around the city. So SDOT should go to those locations and you know, look at the existing conditions and determine whether anything can be done uh, to prevent those crashes from happening in the first place. So we very much are on this path where we believe we'll be able to get out of uh, what I would consider more reactionary mode, where we um, are always reacting to the crashes that happen on our streets, and get into a more uh, proactive mode where we can anticipate where crashes are occurring and do something before they actually happen, uh, which of course will help us uh, towards our goal of eliminating serious injuries and uh, crashes um, on our streets. Thanks. Why don't you hand the mic over the, to Dana next. Um, so oh, a little over a year ago, I guess a year ago in March, Candace and I um, were, you know, basically participated in something called Hack the Commute. And one of the things that we did um, for Hack the Commute is collect a whole bunch of data. And one of the people um, who was... Uh, very responsible for providing a lot of that data and then participating in the actual hack was Dana. And um, I just would like you to talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you because I think it surprised you in some ways. Yeah, so um, I, I was brought in to help out with SDOT's data. Um, I, just to give a little background, um, as I said, I was GIS person by trade, and GIS people tend to be um, very willing to share data, I think because a lot of times you need other people's data to complete a map. Um, so we'd been sharing data since 2010 um, out on data.cl.gov, and I had some policies in place already. If we had a public web map, for example, we had the data up. Um, we'd get some push every once in a while to put data sets up, but it was, it was pretty kind of liberal as to what we were putting up. And so Hack the Commute really kind of honed in on the need for putting up a lot of our data, um, everything that we had pretty much that could that we could think of. So um, it was a push, I want to say. It, Candace and, and Bruce did an excellent job because it was a large event and it was put on in a pretty short amount of time. However, um, through the course of it, I, I really learned that um, it, that by having data, um, citizens can help solve other citizen problems, and it's not it's not just us within SDOT that need to solve like be responsible for um, putting together applications, for example, to solve problems. Um, one of the kind of the background on that is we have a, a traditionally a pretty small IT group, and we spend a lot of time supporting our SDOT staff, and um, in some days that feels really overwhelming. So to have you know to have to also think about supporting citizens with applications um, sometimes can be really tough. But I really realized after this event that we don't necessarily need to solve all the problems, but we do need to be really transparent and have data available. We're very lucky within SDOT. We don't have a lot of data, for example, that has a lot of, of privacy concerns or security issues. And I would say that was, that was also um, one of the benefits on our side because we were able to put up a, a lot of our data. 
Um, I would say one of the other things that I, I'm um, soapboxing, Susie Brunzel is one of my senior GIS analysts in the back, and she's probably tired of this one, but I, I soapboxed a little bit on really the next step in my mind is um, coming up with some, some data structures um, that are standards. So even we've tried to put together, for example, a road closure map with King County, and it's been difficult because our road closures come out of several different types of data. And without having a, a, you know, a structure that we can all share data in, for example, or at least um, have a, a common structure that we can um, translate data into, it, it's really difficult for people to put together different data from different agencies. So that's, that's one of, been one of my takeaways as well that uh, I've been talking about to um, some of the private entities as well. So um, you had a similar experience, Ali. Uh, just a couple of months ago, we did a, another hackathon. Oh, by the way, does everybody understand what a hackathon is, more or less, or should I go through a little thing? I, okay, you got to understand a hackathon. All right. Well, um, we did one for parks and recreation, and once again, um, Chris and his team got a whole bunch of data up in a real short amount of time, um, like about 55 maps in two weeks on open data. And then we had 95 people show up and use it. And what was that experience like for you? Uh, amazing. It's uh, the only way I can, I can describe that. I, I want to thank um, my team. Um, Jesus was really um, very adamant about it. Jasmine uh, was really doing everything that she can to help us uh, get everything together. And then uh, Chris, uh, Patrick, uh, Rodney, Chikundi, Shelly, um, and you two, um, um, uh, Bruce and, and Candace, you guys were really wonderful. And I, um, I'll, I'll be honest, I kind of had a lot on my mind when this came through and I was thinking, another um, unfunded mandate, then how am I going to do this? You know, I've got a lot of things on my plate. But then uh, eventually I, I kind of warmed up to it. So I'm, I'm going to confess about that. But it was really a wonderful thing. Um, there were 26 entries at the hackathon, and um, uh, really wonderful things. Let me just say a couple of them. Uh, some of the names of the uh, entries, Beyond Access, Bag the Parks, uh, Tennis for Two, uh, Fetch Me, Under Tour, Doggy Deck, Trail, Trail Buds. I mean, these were really wonderful applications that worked. So of the 26, 22 um, showed us something that worked. And one, I'll, I'll just share with you one that really blew my mind. Um, it was, uh, uh, it, it took our trails data. We had about 56, 57, right? 57 data sets that we provided. This is information about uh, community centers, uh, uh, people counters at community centers, trails, maps, and a whole bunch of other things that we provided. And this was an application that used our trails information and, and then um, on top of it, they, they put the LiDAR information, and they were able to kind of uh, show uh, where uh, the, um, the trail could be inaccessible. So this really solved some of the ac um, uh, accessibility issues. I, I, was, I was really very impressed by that. Um, you know, I was thinking about, okay, what, what, what does this mean? I, I think we're coming to a different kind of understanding about, um, about data. Um, I, I started a while back, uh, early 80s, um, in, in programming. And I did program in old languages like COBOL and Fortran. Uh, at that time, data was the uh, asset of the programmer. You know, you go and ask John how to do that. He'll solve it for you. So it really made the programmer very powerful. Then um, in, in the 80s and early 90s, there was the uh, LAN admin and so on, and the group Became, uh, it became the asset of the group. the group. The group was the one that was using it to kind of pro project their power. And then it became a, um, what, what it was called the corporate asset. So uh, kind of as a whole, that's when the data warehouses came. But now I think what we're saying is it's really a community asset. I think that that's where you are going. I, um, uh, you don't have to struggle with, we don't have to struggle with this. We are lucky. But I think um, th there's something that we need to do here. I, I'll come to it uh, later on. But I think this is a journey, and um, IT directors and IT managers need to be aware of that. It's not only for our internal consumption, but it's also for 
uh, our community that we're building this uh, uh, this database and data sets. Um, so there is what I learned from that was that there was excitement, there was a lot of demand for the data, and there was just some cool things that they could w do with it. And I saw excitement, and I was really excited. I'll I'll just tell you that I, th that was absolutely exciting. And it can be used both ways. We can learn a lot about what could be done, and they can also learn a lot about what's available, and also push us to produce some of the data, you know, recognize the gaps, and, and help us uh, produce the data that's needed. You know, some challenges that I saw. One challenge for me was, um, how do we nurture these applications? And I think uh, the um, Hack Oregon, probably you guys, uh, the, the solution that you guys have is, is a good one. We went, uh, we went back, and then uh, Chikundi, one of our um, uh, very entrepreneurial uh, uh, people in, um, uh, at parks, tried to have a, a group of um, uh, volunteers to work on his apps so that he can push forward. But the problem that we had was, how can we um, uh, keep it current, fresh, how can we support them, and how can we um, move forward? Because these this applications, they just get done once, and then what happens to them? Uh, who's going to maintain them? That is the issue that we couldn't solve. So maybe the solution that um, Hack Oregon has got of having a, a non-profit um, non organization kind of dealing with that kind of open source, maybe a solution. The second one was um, a common open platform. I think it, we, we need that. The interfaces were a little bit clunky. I could see that. You know, uh, my team was struggling with it, um, and and maybe that's a future. In the future, we need a, a common platform and um, with APIs that are defined that um, all governments can can relate to and put their data in there. Uh, I taught, uh, you know, thinking about regional, like, uh, like you said, GIS, I'm, as in the GIS community too. So thinking regional, uh, not only within the city, but cooperating with, uh, and coordinating and integrating, say, with King County and other cities that are here, with the state, and and eventually with uh, with the federal government, because a trail doesn't start in Seattle and end in Seattle. It just goes all the way. And hey, wouldn't it be nice to have one thing that's gonna. Um, make this available to the community as one entity. Um, and then creating an overarching framework for all to exchange and to, to use the data. Those are the things that I learned from that. Thanks. So hand it to Will. And so one of the things that's been brought up already a couple of times is this whole idea that, um, OK, here we have open data, and we've got a lot of responsibility, and we have a policy, and we have to get out there. And I cannot think of anybody I know who's more articulate about talking about the reasons why government should do this and, oh, by the way, selling his departments than Will. So go for it. <laughs> tell these guys what you tell your, your departments uh, at the state. So <clears throat> not everything that's important to the community has to be done by government. And most agencies in Olympia don't just work with other agencies. They also work with external partners. Um, and I don't know if this is the case with city agencies as well, but if you work for you know, the Department of Natural Resources, there's probably 15 or 20 nonprofits, local governments, uh, Indian tribes, and other folks who work on similar issues and are your principal data customers, or they're the people outside of the enterprise of state government who work on the same issues that you care about. If you work uh, in employment security, there are people who are employers, and they hire the people that you want to see get jobs. So for most state agencies, there, is a, there are currently existing um, outside partners who are interested in working on the same issues that government agencies work on. I think one of the most compelling arguments for open data for a state agency is that if you can inform the people who are your natural allies outside of state government to do more along the lines of the things that you're already doing, you'll get better understanding with them. They'll be able to do more on their own, and you'll be able to focus on the things that are really your core mission. That's argument number one. Argument number two is public records. Um, RCW 4256520 states that it's a complete and sufficient answer to a public records request to refer the requester to where that information is already posted on a website. So is there anybody in here who has never responded to a public records request? 
Is there anybody in here who would really like to respond to another public records request? <laughs> so you have at, at your disposal an alternative. Post the data first. Don't wait. So that's argument number two, is don't wait for the public records request. It's a lot easier to deal with it on your own terms when you have the time and to post the information that you think your partners most want and need. And lastly, there are more arguments, there are more agencies within state government than you know. There are boards and commissions. There's the Apple Commission, there's the Squirrel Commission, there's the, no, there may not be a Squirrel Commission, sorry. <laughs> but there is an Apple Commission and there's a Traffic Safety Commission. Using the transportation metaphor, virtually nothing gets done by one agency alone. It's all the result of collaboration within government and usually with external stakeholders. And the only way that the County Road Advisory Board, the Department of Transportation, the State Patrol, and um, Agency X um, can actually exchange data because they're not on the same IT network. We can't agree completely on, an, on one system of record for all of our databases and all of our servers and all of our networks is through open data. And we do this mostly through data sharing agreements or through ad hoc requests. Hey, listen, I have got a project I really need to get done by next week and in order to make it work, I need data on a Soton County squirrel accidents. Gee, I don't know about that, but we could call the county assessor or we could call, so ad hoc data transfers are the way, I mean, it's the coin of the realm when you're doing analysis in government. If we can just improve the way that we exchange that data so that once you set up that relationship, you don't have to make that call again the next time and wonder if the person's on vacation. Um, exchanging data is still exchanging data. A lot of it is category one safe public data. There's no reason why it has to stay behind the firewall or be hidden inside of government. Boards and commissions, local governments, state agencies, even federal government, well, maybe not the feds. But local governments, state government, nonprofits can all exchange data in the open. Now there's some stuff you never want to see in the open, but there's a lot of stuff about fish, about squirrels, about roads, about intersections that really can be public and there's no reason to encrypt it, hide it behind a firewall and subject it to cybersecurity. So three arguments. There you have more partners than you know. You need to know what they want. Number two, everybody loves public records, right? Number three, um, there are advantages to just doing simple data exchange better. Some of it's open, all of it's better. Thanks. Thanks for doing my work for me. <laughs> so, um, there's this the thing I'd like to explore a little bit more too um, about, especially along the lines of what Kat was saying, because, and this is what Candace is involved with um, as well, but, um, and I, anybody, how do you see um, the working with the our our, our public, not necessarily the um, the commercial, but the the you know when here in Seattle we have Open Seattle, but the people that show up at the hackathons, um, what would you like to see us? How would you like to see us be able to communicate with us? I'm going to start with you, Dana, on that. You got an answer to that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, how, I mean, what, what, how would you see us pursuing those kinds of relationships, I guess? Go ahead and grab that mic. It's, they're all good. So I think um, formal and informal, I would say, for communication out to our, um, I'm going to say partners. So I know um, the Hack Accessible group, which is um, who won the Hack the Commute. They've been in to talk to me a couple of times, um, to talk to my group, talk about where they are in their project, where it could go forward. Um, I'd like to see a lot more of, of city staff involved in in things like the hackathons. I think um, it's a growing experience, um, and. Having Bruce, having uh, your group um, in the city and putting on things like the data camp, I think that's really important for engaging um, both ways with coming into the city in this case and going out. Um, so, but it, it really takes, um, in my mind, it takes some time. It takes some, um, like, uh, you have to recognize it as a 
employee that it's an important thing in your day-to-day -day, um, hours. And if, you know, we have a mandate for open data within the city now, and I think that's really important because it, it shows as um, a city of Seattle employee that this is something that's important to the mayor and therefore should be important to me um, and the staff I manage. Thanks. So, Mark, how are you reaching out to, you know, your community partners or the people that are asking the questions about the uh, data that you're using in the NC stats, et cetera? Sure. So one of the ways, when we stood up the public dashboard, we knew uh, right away we were interested in replacing our old static statistical report. So. We wanted to put something up first, but we wanted to get feedback. So one of the first things we did is we developed um, an email. So if you go to our um, our dashboard, you'll see there's a crime dashboard at seattle.gov, and we make it very clear that we want to solicit feedback. Now people still like to ask us for other data and think it's a it's a research avenue, but we get good feedback. And basically, what we said is, hey, let us know what you think. What did we get right? What other data sets would you like to see? What's not working? What seems to be kind of finicky here, as you or confusing, maybe that we didn't explain. And that's been, I think that's been a good venue. We have people who monitor that, um, two of our data-driven analysts who actually look at that and feedback. Now, we don't respond to it, and we don't take every little comment and say, oh, we're going to rework the whole system. But what we do is we kind of let it gather up, and then on a quarterly basis, we revisit the themes that, that surface. And then we say, hey, is that something we think we could do? Uh, maybe we can put that out. I mean, recently, one of the things that was asked for is, we just had all the years going back to 2008, and it was a, there was a simple bar chart just to visualize the data that was already in a table above it. But folks really wanted to see the annual comparisons over each other and be able to select multiple years and multiple categories. And that was simple enough for us to change in the application. So we thought, okay, why not? I mean, that's something we saw multiple times that folks were asking for. And so we responded to them in that way, not directly, but just by um, responding to their feedback. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is one of the questions I get asked a lot is that, you know, not only is there, you know, are we making the data open, but there is going to be some volume of input from the community about that. But my experience over doing this for about five years now is that it's not overwhelming if you take an approach like SPD has. Um, you don't necessarily have to respond to every every single request. Um, so, I mean, you have to look and you have to uh, make your decisions about that. Um, what about you, um, Jim? The, the, what do you see going forward? Because your, your, um, your project's sort of in the early stages, I think, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. So we got started with our bicycle and pedestrian safety analysis last year. We've got four epidemiologists on board to help us uh, crunch the, uh, the data. And then uh, through City IT, we had the opportunity to partner up with Microsoft and Datakind, which is a nonprofit group of data scientists, to, uh, to really help us take it to the next level. I mean, I think I mentioned earlier, we have an immense amount of data. And for each of our crashes, we have uh, a, a plethora of additional information that goes along. Uh, with each specific crash. So if there's one crash and there's six people involved, the, the records multiply really quickly. Um, so having these partnerships uh, and, and having the opportunity to work with Datacon and Microsoft has really help, helped us uh, take the analysis really to the next level. Um, I, I really do believe that this is going to help us um, really be able to kind of innovate the way that we, we process our, and identify our work. Um, uh, I think without a doubt uh, there is a strong uh, uh, kind of a cry for, for in improved safety in the city of Seattle and there are a lot of people out there that, um, that really care very deeply about this and having data available to folks is going to give them the information that they need to, to help understand what's happening on their streets, uh, whether it's in their neighborhood or citywide. So uh, a little bit later this week, we're actually going to be putting up our own dashboard to help people uh, see uh, exactly what's happening in the city. And you know, I think in part it is an, an effort to uh, help people understand the rationale behind Vision Zero. Um, so we provide statistics like 
um, you know, percentage of injuries per crashes, um, you know, particularly, again, for people walking and biking, you know, if, you're, if you are hit by a vehicle as a pedestrian or a bicyclist, you know, you're, you're looking at a greater than 75% chance of injury, right? So we need people to understand why we are doing what we are doing out there to help build support and consensus for what uh, we're doing. So I think the dashboard is going to help with that. Uh, uh, but also there's a component of it that we'll be providing some collision data as well. So uh, for people who want to get deeper into uh, the weeds with what's happening out there, I think you know we are totally opening, open to partnering uh, with um, you know, private uh, residents, um, but also some of the organizations. And I think uh, in Seattle we have a ton of groups that are willing to help us improve safety here in the city. So we work all the time with the University of Washington and the various different universities around uh, town here, uh, as well as like the Harborview Injury Prevention folks. Uh, uh, as well as uh, Public Health Seattle and King County. So I do think moving forward, having this data available, uh, readily available and uh, open is only going to help us gain more valuable insights into what's happening on our streets. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Al, <laughs> I'll be uh, running around with the microphone here. I don't know if this one is more of a question or an observation, but um, and Jim's group probably has another word for what laymen like me would call a right cross. A right cross is when a car turns right th over a crosswalk, over a speed bump, and you're the speed bump. <laughs> I've been the speed bump twice, and both intersections years later were studied and I'm happy to say that nobody else will be a speed bump because they amended the intersections. That's awesome. As government people, that's how we look at the data, right? We're like studying, looking for opportunities. As the speed bump, what I would have really liked would be if my phone, which knows where I am all the time, or my watch, which knows where I am, or my headphones, or any other thing, warn me, hey, this intersection has had problems. It's being studied. <laughs> Be extra careful. Because, you know, while we as government, we're looking at the data as something to go out there and study, the community is looking at it from the point of view of the internet, right? I need immediate gratification blasted. I need to know right now that I'm at a dangerous spot so I can be even more terrified than usual. <laughs> so just wanted to mention to all of you data holders that our lens through which we look at the data tends to be longer term, but there are other people, other partners out there who might be able to do something right now with our data while we're doing something longer term. Thanks. So, so it turns out that, uh, oh, Al's from King County, by the way, um, turns out that, <laughs> it turns out that uh, an, an open data guy can be a community member too and work that partnership. We have other questions? Hi, I wanted to hear from Jim and Mark about any kind of predictive or um, experimental research you're doing uh, into modeling um, future events. Um, I'll, I'll start on that. Um, so we, were, we meet monthly with the Seattle Police Department to uh, just kind of keep an eye on trends and uh, really understand what's happening on our streets. Um, and we develop our enforcement priorities completely 100% based on what the data is telling us. Um, I, I would say that, of course, there is a community policing component to what SPD does, and when they do receive uh, complaints or requests for extra patrols, they do respond to that as well. But we, when working with the uh, traffic section on the Vision Zero initiative, um, you know, we very much look to the data to to understand you know, what has happened on our streets in the last few years and where the frequency of collisions is high uh, enough for us to understand that the likelihood of more crashes there is, uh, is also very high. And so um, we have 
uh, a high collision program, uh, a high collision evaluation program, I should say. It is not a high collision program. We do not go out and cause crashes. Uh, but we evaluate those locations where collisions occur more frequently than other uh, places. And there are so many different factors in traffic collisions. Um, that it gives us a really, really wide range of uh, different things for the police to look out to when they're out on patrol. It also helps us guide where police resources are deployed to. And you probably could guess a lot of these different corridors in the city, uh, like Aurora and Rainier. Our big principal arterial streets are generally where the majority of crashes occur. But there are also other locations that you know probably wouldn't come to mind. Uh, where we have, you know, higher frequencies of pedestrian or bicycle collisions. And so we take that information um, and help develop our annual priorities for enforcement. Uh, again, as our work on the bicycle and pedestrian safety analysis and our work with Datacon and Microsoft continues, we will wrap that into our prioritization so that hopefully we'll have, you know, more, again, of that proactive method of setting our priorities rather than the, the reactive. So from a predictive modeling standpoint, the department's um, experimented with a couple different analytical techniques and software over the years that I've been familiar with. You know, up to this point, I would say that we still kind of stick to the very uh, true and tried analytical techniques that uh, human beings use at this point. I mean, they do use software to leverage them, but, you know, from a research perspective, there's still, jury's still out a lot on these predictive modeling, and we've looked at them. You know, they can draw boxes and they can tell us where our officers need to go and where they should be, but you know, you don't want to blindly just follow that. Uh, a couple specific examples more recently is we do a lot of seasonality. Uh, we've been doing some modeling with, for instance, uh, we've been working very closely with the, the city and the mayor's office on a summer safety initiative, right? We know where we continue to have issues during the summer months and the type of activity that ramps up. So we've got really good data to do that, and we wait that, we look at that, we try to prepare for that. We can get down to street segment levels and block analysis and make sure that we have the appropriate resources, and we also do that to try to improve response times and um, anytime we do deployment or redistricting or remodeling when we're adding new officers, or we look at, you know, do we have enough officers for this jurisdiction and how long does it take them to get from the farthest part of their beat, you know, to, to the other end. So we do do that and we do take it into account. We're not on any type of automated mode, though, where we, we trust a piece of software to tell us where to go every day. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Mary Catherine Snyder on the STOP parking team. And so we manage, as Dana knows, um, with all our pay stations, we do 10 to 12 million transactions a year. And we have all those records. So it's kind of a big data set. And I was curious with the other departments, um, how you han handle large data sets, whatever you think of that, and just even how to have tools to be able to do that effectively. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that's the right question for this panel. Maybe we, anybody want to take that? Maybe we. Uh, <laughs> maybe we'll hold that for uh, for later in the later in data camp. Okay. okay. Other questions? Oh, by the way, I want to just thank. We have people from King County. I think. Anyway, did Katie from Tacoma come show yet? No, she will be. And uh, obviously, Will from the state and from the city of Bellevue. So it's really nice to have them here. Hey, I, I know the topic here is what's worked, but I kind of want to flip that and ask you if, if you have any times that something just hasn't worked or maybe some red flags that came up that something to look out for to avoid a situation or a strategy that just backfired, anything along those lines. Sure, I'll take that. I thought you might. <laughs> Failure number one, expecting people from Olympia to come to Seattle. Failure number two, counting on a hackathon. Um, failure number three, counting on a particular person in leadership. Um, I think the way that open data survives is as a business practice. It doesn't survive. You can't bet on any particular stock. You can't bet on any particular data set. Some of the most popular and long-term successful and useful data sets for the state are not the ones that I would ever have guessed 
or bet on or met somebody who actually uses, and yet they turn up. Like water rights. There's a state water rights database on a data set on data.wa.gov. It's been a perennial favorite because water rights are first in time, first in right, right? So anybody who lives east of the mountain has to know the seniority of the water rights of all of their neighbors in order to know how much stuff they can grow next year. So uh, failure number one is expecting people to travel. Um, you guys have a really rich, fortunate environment here where you have people who have time and expertise who are willing to come out and work on civic projects for the betterment of the community. Um, you should use that and treasure that opportunity. Number two, hackathons by themselves are not cure-alls. They're publicity stunts. They're fabulous, fun events, but they're not actually a substitute for real work. Um, so when you do a hackathon, don't expect that you're going to wind up with you know, the next um, tableau. Um, and failure number three is don't bet all your programmatic expectations on one particular person or one particular initiative. I've done all of those. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, the the hackathon one, um, I, yes, but I think that there's some something to it too. Um, it really generates a lot of uh, interest within um, the organization itself, and it shows what is possible. Now, failure from that for us was that we tried to uh, spin off a group of. Um, uh, volunteers so that they can develop apps for us. But that really was not well defined. We just found out that that, that was not workable. So um, maybe that. But I, I think I still will go with hackathons. <laughs> okay. uh, this is Greg Babinski from King County. And uh, you know, I, I liked a lot of the things that I heard, um, you know, hearing about um, uh, you know, this is cool, we have open data, I, but we still have problems with standardization and things like that. Um, but, you know, I've been thinking, sitting here this morning, about a process of government, and a process of government is you identify a problem, you know, whether Catherine talked about, you know, childhood hunger in Oregon, or uh, right cross turns is, is uh, endangering citizens. And it, it seems like open data can um, identify how the community thinks about what the problems are in our community. And then the job of government is to develop programs to make our, you know, to eliminate hunger or to eliminate the danger from transportation network or to get more people using buses to find the trails and the parks and stuff like that. Um, a couple of times I heard data scientist, and I think the real potential, what does data science mean? And it means that you know, we're testing the programs that we're developing for Seattle or King County or Bellevue or the state of Washington, and we're comparing it with other governments, other programs. We can't, you know, we can't uh, invest in all of the potential options that there are. And I'm just wondering if there's any you know, visibility within the city of Seattle to using open data in other cities to try to look for problems that peer cities are encountering in analyzing the programs that we're implementing against the programs that are implemented in, in other cities, maybe San Francisco or Oakland or Portland or wherever, to try to develop a science of government, a, science of deciding which programs that we're going to implement. This seems like a great potential for open data. Anybody want to take that? I might be able to answer that. Um, so, uh, you know, Vision Zero is not just a Seattle thing. It's actually kind of a worldwide thing. Started in Sweden in the 1990s. Uh, but recently in the United States, it's really kind of gained steam with New York City uh, coming out as a Vision Zero city in 2014, uh, then Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, you know, all the big cities uh, across the country, you know, are really honing in on something, uh, on, on this issue as something important that, um, you know, costs us to spend our valuable resources in one way, shape, or form or another, whether it's our limited resources, very good, yes, exactly. So whether it's deploying the fire or police department to the scene of a crash or the congestion that a crash can cause, or of course, you know, there's 
huge impacts to people and families and whatnot. So um, I would say that there is an effort underway amongst this, uh, the Vision Zero cities, if you will, to share information and maybe not necessarily get to that point where we're all kind of cross-referencing each other's work just yet. Um, but we're definitely heading in that direction. So there's um, a network that is based out of San Francisco called the Vision Zero Network. And uh, so they do a great job of bringing us all together. Um, we you know, uh, meet up once a year, uh, but we also talk twice a month about the different initiatives that we're all taking on. And we're all trying to kind of crack the same egg, but we're all taking kind of different paths to get there. So at some point, I do think we will kind of convene and compare notes, see what's working well, uh, what's not working well, what insights we found, what innovations we found as well. So we're heading in that direction, but we're just not there yet. Yeah, another one I'd bring up really quickly before we wrap up is the White House Policing Data Initiative that uh, basically now has about 40 cities in the, uh, uh, how many? 56, yeah, Mary would know better. So, I um, mean, one of the conversations there um, along about with just getting data out in the open is what are the standards for, for instance, um, officer-involved shooting data? What do you put out? So, anyway, um, I'd like to thank the panelists. Uh, we got Will, Ailey, Mark, Dana, and Jim. Thanks so much. Um, another quick break, and I think up next is uh, Michael again. So, Once again, given Michael a fantastic task um, to be the last thing standing between you and lunch. But it's important, um, and I'm really glad that he's here to share um, the expanded vision of our IT leadership in the city for the Open Data Program um, and what it means for you and what we're hoping to get out of it. So come on up, Michael. Thank you. All right, does this work? If it turns green, it will work. Okay. How many technologists does it take to turn on a microphone? 42? Maybe we can get that down with consolidation to 30. Oh, well. Well, great. Well, thank you again for letting me uh, interrupt your day. Uh, as many of you know, I find the Open Data Program incredibly exciting. And <clears throat> as we move into Seattle IT and we begin to work together uh, for so many of our, thank you, city employees to create a shared vision for technology, it's important that we think about the role that data not only plays to our city, but specifically open data. When you look across our city, we're fortunate to be in a high-tech hub where we are experiencing tremendous growth. Who are the folks here from OED or SDCI? No one yet? OK. Oh, one person. Great. So you know better than I, but I'm told Seattle has grown by 70,000 professionals in the past five years, and that we're on track to add 120,000 more uh, in, in the next 20. That's incredible. It's a 30% growth in our population, and yet we're not adding land. And we're also not going to add a proportionate number of technology professionals in the city, or city staff in general. So what that means is we need to find ways of working smarter, of working more efficiently. And that means finding new capacity that is sometimes outside of government so that we can leverage the creative and, and technology capacity of our community. And so what I want to share first are a few projects that have happened uh, in the recent years here in the city that are really great showcases of what can happen when we open our city resources like data and we bring in those outside of the city to partner. So Bruce, if you want to kick us over to the first slide. Uh, many of you know that Seattle is a true leader when it comes to uh, stewardship of our environment. We're very environmentally conscious, and we have a commitment to become um, carbon neutral by the year 2050. That is a huge goal. We have made great progress. Many of you know that Seattle City Light has been carbon neutral since the year 2006, 10 years. And yet, we still have many other forms of pollution in our environment. And when you look at one of our largest sources of pollution, you look at our downtown business district, where so many uh, people work 
every single day. They commute to work, they consume water, they use electricity. So how is it that we can reduce energy usage in our downtown core? Well, some of you may know, a couple years ago, the Seattle 2030 district was formed. The idea was, how do we take a partnership between our Office of Sustainability here in the city, work with business owners and with companies to encourage less energy usage? So the partnership was formed, and building owners were, set, were told, hey, why don't you give us your energy usage data? You know, submit it to us, we'll do some benchmarking, and we'll tell you how you compare to your peers. And that was great. Um, as you can see from the screen, 230 buildings, about 45% of our downtown capacity, joined the program, shared data. They saw if they were above the average, and they were given tips to reduce their consumption. Quick win for data. But we didn't stop there. The partnership uh, in was expanded to include Microsoft and Accenture. And what they did is they took all of the data, they said we need more information, they worked with building owners to censor their environments, to get information in real time from their HVAC systems, from their water systems, and ran that all through an Azure machine learning algorithm. And what happened is the partnership can now give building owners more actionable feedback. It's not just how do you compare to your peers, but here are specific changes you can make to reduce your energy consumption. And as you can see, the program has had tremendous results. Um, across these buildings, 45% of our downtown capacity, 54 million square feet of office space have reduced their carbon footprint by a really big number. And I get in trouble when I try and say what that means, but it's a lot. <laughs> so that's what can happen when we work with, with corporations who bring some ideas to the table. Bruce, why don't you kick us over? Now, of course, I'm assuming most people in this room are Seattle residents, give or take, in the area. So you know it rains here a little bit, right? Uh, but what is interesting about Seattle is that we have so many lines of business in the city that are affected by rain, and we know that they're affected disproportionately. So when a downpour occurs, organizations like Seattle Public Utilities have to think about the sewer system, the drainage system. What happens if we have flooding because a drain gets blocked and overflows, or because there is some disparate impacts in one of these neighborhoods based on the age of infrastructure or how rain is falling. Um, so they were looking to get some data about how rain affects our city that could be used in an actionable manner. So they partnered with the University of Washington and they deployed a series of rain gauge buckets, these things you see on the right hand side here with James. And they put 20 of them around the city and they looked to see what happens when rain falls. How much rainfall, where in the city, is there any um, disparity? And what they found is surprising. Uh, we don't see uniform rainfall across the city. We have microclimates. So as you can see in the map on the left, uh, downtown tends to get the least amount of rain compared to, say, Rainier Beach, which gets quite a bit more. And the disparity between downtown and Rainier Beach is actually eight inches of rain per year, or more the, than the entire city of Phoenix will get in a year. That's a pretty big difference. So if we understand that a storm is coming and you're an SPU, you, might, you now know Let's think about rolling trucks to Rainier Valley because they could be affected more so than other parts of the city. Now, of course, that's some great initial data, but that's still not as useful as it could be. So we pulled in the National Weather Service as part of this part partnership team. And what they did is they started collecting real-time information from the rain gauge buckets, um, along with the models from UW. And we were able to create hyper-local forecasts that now, with one hour's notice, can predict if a sudden rain event is going to occur. When that hyperlocal forecast is triggered, an alert goes to SPU. Not only that rain is about to happen, but where in the city and historically how that impact could affect the built environment. So now SPU can roll a truck to a part of the city that is likely to be affected by rain before a public safety or other hazard is likely to occur. And that's one way we're becoming smarter. Um, and it's partnerships like this where we're working with universities that we hope to do much more of in the future through our participation in an organization called the Metro Lab Network, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Now, if we move to the next slide, nothing vexes Seattle more than traffic. As we take all of our 120,000 new people in the next 20 years, the 70,000 people that we have added in the past five, we are trying to put them onto the same number of lanes on I-5. Now, as I love it when the folks in SDOT say, we could either continue to add lanes until we pave all the way to Elliott Bay, or we could think about new solutions to solving our transportation challenges. And who better to help us solve them than all of those new people that are moving to our city for technology jobs? 
So you may remember last year, we ran an event called Hack the Commute. Let's have a hackathon. Let's think about our open data and having people use that for creative, new, innovative transportation solutions, which is great. But we didn't start there. Um, and we're so thankful to have Candace lead this effort. Um, we actually stepped back and said, let's engage those people that we hope to have at the hackathon and understand what types of solutions they could envision if data was available. So we had a, a corporate roundtable. We went to co-working sites and had a happy hour with devs. And we asked that question. You know, what is your vision for a technology-enabled transportation system, and what do you need to do it? Based on their input, Candace and Bruce and others in this room and across the city worked with six regional governments to open up 150 new data sets. So that when we got in the room for the hackathon, it wasn't just really smart people writing code that might do something interesting. They actually had the tools they needed to be successful. We brought subject matter experts from SDOT and from WASDOT and even USDOT so that if there was a question about how to use that data or how a technology solution might work in practice, they got real-time feedback. And as a result of that effort, we got 14 prototype solutions for how to make our transportation system better. We narrowed down to three teams. We gave those teams extra investment from our technology community. And we had a final judging round in this room where we picked a winning solution. Now, not all of the solutions were apps. I mean, some of them were on your smartphone, my favorite. There was a team called Ferry Ferry to help people who take the ferry better understand when there might be capacity issues based on predictive analytics and even um, interpretation of the uh, camera data that comes in. That was cool. Uh, but this team that you see here actually created a low-cost sensor by hacking a cell phone. They literally went to the store and got a $40 cell phone, tore it up, re-engineered it a little bit. And what they were looking for was capacity of the bike racks on the front of a bus. If you think about Lake Washington, especially before the new 520, if you were at the Mont Lake stop and wanted to get over to Redmond and you were riding your bike, you could wait sometimes three, four longer number of bus cycles because you weren't sure what that capacity was. Now we know when you get more data about capacity of transit systems, you're more likely to take it. Think about one bus away. That one app that was created by a team of University of Washington students can now be traced to a 1% increase in ridership on the New York City transit system. So you think about what 1% of capacity in New York City's transit system is, it's incredible. And the reason is, is because people now have the data they need to make decisions and feel more confident that a bus or a subway is going to be there when they need it. All amazing changes from when we partner with our community, when we partner with people who can bring skills and capacity that sometimes we're just too busy in our days um, to bring solutions to bear. So on our next slide, if we think about all this goodness, all the great things we can do when we partner with our communities, um, what is the product that we're selling them, as it were? How do we bring government to our public to engage? Well, that was one of the driving forces of Mayor Murray signing an executive order in February that said our city will be open by preference. And what does that mean? That means from the outset, when we think about collecting data or generating data, going forward, we need to think about how we're going to share that data with the public. And there's this tension about sharing data. I recognize that. Here in uh, government, I'll admit, sometimes my first tendency is to say, oh, shoot, I can't share this data or my numbers about Seattle IT until I know they're absolutely perfect or I know exactly what someone's going to do with them. Well, sometimes sharing the data and providing that transparency is a great enabler to think about what innovative idea could come from someone who has a different take on this information or perhaps brings a different life experience, that diversity that makes our community so strong. So I think we have an interesting opportunity with the people in this room and all of you when you go back to your departments to share what you're learning today and all the enthusiasm and incitement that can come from sharing our data and some of the solutions that have added real value to our public. On the next slide, though, when we think about all those cool and innovative solutions, let's use an example, the Find It, Fix It app. Who in here has used Find It, Fix It? Some folks. Who has it installed on your mobile phone? OK, we can do better than that. At lunch, go to your app store, download Find It, Fix It. For those who haven't used it, Find It, Fix It is a great application um, that was developed um, in partnership with FAS and what is now Seattle IT to allow the public to report problems in our city to our Customer Service Bureau. You see graffiti, snap a picture of it. 
if you have, see a pothole, snap a picture or submit a request, abandoned yard furniture, other types of uh, tree issues, out street lamps, those types of things, all can be submitted through the app for rapid attention from the city. Really great concept. Meet people where they are, use modern technology. Now, of course, there's a risk here, which is, as a mobile app, what data is this application collecting? Optionally, you can give it your name and email address, but is it collecting background information about you, like a device identifier, your IP address, your geolocation, where you are at the moment you request something, so the combination of your geolocator plus your requests over time plus where you go on a daily basis might aggregate to tell us a bigger story of who you are, and by the way, is this data set open to public disclosure? So some questions there. Some questions that might make someone uncomfortable if they didn't trust in, one, what their data is being collected, or how their government is collecting their data, and two, who's actually getting access to it, whether intentionally through an open data portal or through a PDR. So we've got this tension, and uh, we really want to open data because um, we think that there is a public value and that the public can do cool things. Bruce, if you go on to the next slide. Uh, but at the same time, we recognize that there is this risk. So I actually love this picture. You see me probably use it a lot. Uh, so what do we do with this tension? So last year, we partnered with the University of Washington to pursue a grant from the Berkeley Center for Technology and Law to say, how in government can we open data while earning the public trust in what we're doing? And so, Bruce, if you click to the next slide, um, we asked several questions, which you can see here. Um, does open data increase public trust? That whole transparency argument. We open data so people know what government is doing. You know, how do we govern the release of open data so that we can make sure we consider privacy issues? And then lastly, what are the harms that municipalities like the city of Seattle can experience when we share our data? And that's not just open data. There's many ways we share data. A public disclosure request, when we share data with partners, or heaven forbid, when we leave that spreadsheet in the wrong place or on a desk and somebody picks it up. So with the university, we had focus groups. We reviewed contracts. We actually went out into the public to understand their perspectives. And what we heard is really interesting. So first, the hopes. Next slide. Um, Having data be open is an incredible source of accountability. It's key to democracy. Makes sense. Think about what council does. We put legislation online so that people can see it before a vote and choose to respond to it. We have Performance Seattle, where anyone in the city or in the world can see how Mayor Murray is delivering on his commitments. It could be useful for commercial benefit. Open data can do that. Who here has used Zillow? More hands, maybe? OK, a few folks. Uh, I like to call Z Zillow a $4 billion open data company. If you think about what Zillow does, one of their primary features they first rolled with was the Zestimate. Type in an address, we'll tell you how much the house is worth. What did they base that on? Well, a number of factors, but a big one is county assessor data, which is publicly available. And this is a company that then took it one step further to make the information more discoverable and meaningful. If a public agency has, as you said, lots and lots of data, entrepreneurs can use it to make money. One purpose of government is to help citizens thrive, which means putting money back in your pocket. Again, similar concept. Some, some definite opportunity there to figure out how to make data more useful to the public. And hey, it could be a good economic development play. First, if you go to the next slide, what about fears? Data is power now. Let's say you are going through the city of Seattle's open data portal and you focus on crime data, and you know that certain types of crime are occurring in a certain part of town, or maybe they're not occurring in a certain part of town, um, that's some powerful information, especially if you can take that data and pair it up with that same county assessor data to maybe identify who is involved in the crimes, or pair that up to Axiom, a data broker, to see what data they might have on the person that might live at that address, and you start building a very robust picture of who that person is and what's going on. How do you find out which customers are heavy commuters? You just asked the city for all of the tapes about license plates. Does anyone remember what that's a reference to? Uh, Mary can keep me honest. ALPR. ALPR. A couple years ago, someone filed a public disclosure request for all of the license plate data that was being captured by automated license plate readers. Those readers look for stolen cars. Um, there is supposed to be a retention period for the data captured from those readers. 
we didn't follow our retention policy and someone got 10 years worth of data. Point to point data about who is traveling where in the city. Definitely some fear there. It doesn't feel safe to me at all. There's a Seattle Public Utility LGBT group. There was a, a guy requesting all the members' names and information. He was just anti-gay. When we collect data, generally, it is subject to disclosure. And that's something that we forget about, our public forgets about, and something we should consider. When we collect a piece of information, is that something we want to be available to the world? And it's a question we should be asking ourselves now that we are open by preference and as part of our commitment to privacy. Bruce, next slide. So I share those concerns because we do have this tension. We want to be very open. But all of us in this room have a tremendous role to play in thinking about that balance of how do we move faster, how do we enable innovation, and at the same time protect our public. Because if we think about all the things going on that are exciting in the city today, technology is just going to become even more exciting in the future. Um, this is a picture of something called the Array of Things. It is a project that was started in the city of Chicago with a really cool question. Uh, how do we create a Fitbit for the city? How do we use low-cost sensors? How do we create more data about our built environment so that we can make more data-driven policy and operational decisions? The issue they were having was standing water on the roads. When they would have standing water that reached a certain point, it could make it hazardous for buses to traverse those roads. It could make it difficult for other services like waste collection. Oh, and by the way, if you're standing on a curb when a bus comes by you, you tend to get wet if there's standing water. So there's a public concern there, too. So this box is stuffed with 15 different sensors, um, rain sensors, weather sensors, pollution sensors, um, a, a, a photo lens that can actually look for the presence of a certain condition. And they are now in the process of deploying 200 of these around the city so that they can make more data-driven decisions as they understand the effect of pollution on health outcomes, on um, standing water scenario I just mentioned, and a multitude of other use cases they're still developing. Here in the city of Seattle, where we have an electric utility, a water utility, um, waste collection, uh, a whole multitude of programs that focus on our built environment, just think of what we'll be able to do when we no longer have to send a crew to go check something before we decide if we need to offer service. Or we don't have to wait for a consumer complaint. We will know when something's not working, and we can more quickly respond. Oh, and by the way, with some of these sensors, we can make the data available to the public so that we can see what innovative solutions they develop to enhance their community. It's incredibly powerful, and yet at the same time, there is um, perhaps a fear that comes with a city being in the business of collecting this information. So we really have a strong obligation to our public here to earn their trust so that we can work on these really innovative, future-looking technology projects. As we look ahead to the promise of Seattle IT and bringing together a really strong point of view and set of resources around technology in the city, these are some of the things that we're thinking about. We're in the process of developing our two-year strategic agenda that will help guide the direction of where we go on technology projects in the city. Now, for those in various departments who are wondering still, well, how is one IT department going to meet everyone's needs? I've got specific business applications I want or specific business needs. Um, Seattle IT is still fully committed to meeting those needs, but how can we do so in a way that leverages the collective brilliance of our 650 IT professionals, of our partners across the community, and our knowledge of what's happening in the technology industry to give departments more than they know they wanted and to give departments something that will meet their needs now and 10 years from now and have a life cycle to support it. So while that plan is still about six weeks away from being done, I'll just share with you some of the things you're likely to see. Um, number one, service maturity. How are we making sure that when we deliver a service, we're evolving it with technology and we're looking at the legacy 1,200 plus applications we have in the city and thinking about how to make them more modern and usable in a land when we often do work on our smartphones compared to when those systems were implemented 10 years ago before the iPhone existed. Number two, smart and data-driven. As we think as a city of becoming a smarter place with many of the concepts we just saw, how is it we institutionalize the thinking about um, censoring the built environment, leveraging our civic technology program, being open by preference, and doing those things in a way that does continue to earn our public's trust in how we collect and use their data. Number three, digital equity. Equity is critical to so many of our decisions here in the city, um, not the least of which is the Race and Social Justice Initiative. When we deploy a system, 
how are we thinking about the impact on those who may not have access? When we think about those who don't have access, how are we focused on bringing them an internet connection and a device so they can participate in our high-tech society? Here in Seattle today, we still have 15% of our public, or about 90,000 households, that lack a home internet connection. And we've been very focused on closing that gap. And yet at the same time, I don't know if any of you have recently seen the research, we're starting to see that higher income white male head of households are disconnecting their wired internet service because they're now seeing that mobile um, is the way of the future. So some really interesting uh, transitions there that we're, we're looking at at the moment. Number four, public experience. If you are a member of our public and you want to come to the city to get a permit, to apply for a pet license, get a library card, pay your utility bill. I lost count there. How many websites am I visiting? Um, somewhere between five and, and more with different UIs, different passwords. And by the way, for that permit, you probably have to go to the 37th floor of Municipal Tower. We have a tremendous opportunity to rethink how it is government interacts with their public, not just around customer service functions and making those more consistent and straightforward, but how we engage them civically. The way we engage communities hasn't changed for the last 20 years. We throw a meeting at 4 p.m. on a Thursday at Hiawatha Community Center, and then we ask the question, why do I see the same five people I've always seen? Um, there's a joke here about the definition of insanity being, what is it, doing the same thing and wondering why you get the same results. Uh, so that's something that we'll be working on very heavily with the Department of Neighborhoods, we know, but many more opportunities um, across the IT work we, we transact with the city. And then lastly, optimization. Um, this one perhaps doesn't sound quite as much fun, but we did just create the largest, or um, we just affected the largest organizational change in the city in the past 15 years, and we know that we have time to digest that change, to take a look at what Seattle IT is doing, how we work with the city, and to optimize the many processes that are involved in running a modern IT organization. So those are a number of the things we're gonna be thinking about as we build towards a new technology vision for the city. I should have led with this. Um, for those who don't know, our focus in Seattle IT is delivering powerful technology solutions for the city and the public we serve. Through the open data program and the changes that we just walked through in the new projects, um, everyone in this room is very much part of that mission as we build this new department, as we focus on making more data available. And I, I really am just so thankful that you're making time to be part of this event and fulfilling this role, which I know is just one more thing on top of your daily jobs. And I can't wait to see what you produce together. So Candace, thank you, and Bruce for your leadership on this effort, um, and thanks again for your time today. Um, thank you so much, Michael. So just clarifying, because we didn't quite get to Q&A, but it sounds like Michael will be here for lunch. So um, grab a seat at the table next to him if you want to know more about um, his vision for how all of this works together with the Seattle, um, with the brand new Seattle Department of Information Technology.